All right. Hi, my name is Michael Castell. Uh, title is Broker, Broker Fees and Flows, Techniques of Financialization and Consolidation. Um, just a quick outline. Uh, to start, I'm going to contrast the term data and its sort of implicit static connotations um, with the concept of data in motion or data as flow, just as a useful kind of theoretical framework. Um, I'm going to discuss the historical uh, development of synchronous and asynchronous telecommunication techniques. Um, and I'm argue and uh, overall, I'm arguing for the primacy of uh, the financial services industry, so like brokerages and stock exchanges, um, in, the in the development of transaction processing and messaging techniques. Um, and the goal was to kind of produce a genealogy of uh, what are called publish and scribe or message broker techniques um, that are fundamental to various contemporary real-time distributed systems for surveillance or social media, or like civic technology dashboards or the in 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 internet of things. So sort of a long-term uh, historical development of that kind of technique. Um, all right, so this is the basic uh, data versus data in motion perspective, right? I think that we all intuitively know that there's something kind of funny about a uh, conveyor belt sushi. Um, and I think that sometimes when we speak about data and big data, we don't uh, necessarily address the, uh, the static and dynamic qualities of, of it. Um, and so I want to suggest that this taking this uh, dichotomy seriously is kind of a useful philosophical perspective. Uh, in my case, I was studying transactions and sort of thinking about transactions too much as something that happens to a, a static system as opposed to the, the, message, the, the transaction messages uh, as a flow. Um, so with this distinction, we can see some data practices like surveillance as being more about interpretations of a dynamic present um, and others like data mining as interpreting the static archive of the past. Um, you know, for, ex and for example, one can speak of Bitcoin as a, as a ledger or something that feels kind of static, um, or you can think of it as a very slow transaction processing system, so data in motion. Um, so stock exchanges uh, have been doing streaming data since the 19th century um, with transactions reported on the trading floor then sent to dozens and uh, then hundreds of nearby brokerage houses. Um, and it may seem curious that much more attention was paid to transmitting stock quotes and transactions over telegraph wires than, say, human speech, because the telephone came a little bit later. Um, but th this primacy of finance is frequently the case in the history of computing, that something happens on the stock exchange first and then is deployed for other purposes later. Um, and so the connection between the sender and receiver in the case of the stock ticker um, was more direct than an analog te telephone connection, um, which would use an army of switchboard operators and the technique of line switching to produce a temporarily continuous and indexical and therefore synchronous connection um, across long distances. Um, but other types of messages, like telegrams, uh, would be sent asynchronously. So the receiver, um, you know, or sorry, the sender, the sender uh, would send the message and the receiver would not be necessarily listening at that moment. They would receive it sometime later, depending on the priority of the message. Um, and so those messages would be received at some one central office and repeated down the line and eventually delivered, delivered on foot. Um, and this transmission paradigm not only meant that the network lines could be used more efficiently, um, but also, like I said, the sender and receiver were not in the same kind of direct indexical contact uh, as telephony. Um, the teletype machine on the lower left um, automated the encoding and decoding of, uh, of telegraphs, but um, uh, the messages were and the messages were sent on a five bit paper, uh, perforated paper tape, which would be reperforated or printed upon reception. Um, and this latter form of message switching was actually the inspiration for packet switching of the internet um, because uh, uh, of a study that was done on the Western Union uh, teletype message exchange in the 60s. Um, so why did teletype switching need automation in the first place? Um, it was part, in part because of the prolific human labor required for high volumes of messages, which arguably reached its apotheosis in Southeast Asia in the 1960s as the American military became increasingly dependent on message traffic to coordinate um, its campaigns in Vietnam. Um, and you know, at points, number of messages were in the tens of thousands per day, uh, you know, causing the need for a huge number of retransmissions, and operators were sort of, quote unquote, literally waiting in paper tape. Um, at the same time, there was another message glut, which was on Wall Street. Uh, so there was an increased volume of trading due to the prevalence of mutual funds and pensions at that time in the 60s, um, and the stock ticker uh, had begun to fall behind, and they would produce new stock tickers that could print out um, more characters per minute, um, well, simply due to the increase in, in the volume of transactions. Um, this also led to interactive terminals. So here you see the, 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 um, you know, uh, uh, the, the new interactive terminals behind, behind the, the person using the teletype machine. Um, uh, but however, the, the, back, the, sorry, <laughs> the interactive terminals where stock codes could be queried, as well as electronic ticker displays were also developed at this time. Um, however, the back office processes at the stock exchange um, or at the brokerage houses, which do the clearing and settlement of the trades, were not keeping up. And so this led to a so-called paperwork crisis at the end of the 1960s, which I don't discuss here, uh, but it led to the collapse and consolidation of many brokerages. 
Okay, so fast forward to the 80s. Uh, now we have uh, trade quote and news information are available on a variety of incompatible terminals. Um, this is sort of a early manifestation of having too many tabs open or something like this. Um, and so the most common was the Quotron uh, terminal, and there were Reuters and ADP and Telray and other terminals. Um, and Wall Street now had a new problem, which is the heterogeneity of data feeds. Um, more and more markets had become interconnected in real time with each other, um, and various companies were uh, competing to create hardware and software solutions uh, to integrate <coughs> these data flows. And so you'd see ads like this. Um, and many d different ads of this type, you know, overwhelmed and the, oh, all of a sudden. So, so this company is selling a simple video switch that actually just switches between them on a single monitor. It's not, it's not actually dealing with the, with the data. Um, and as you can see, even Gordon Gecko had a few too many terminals in his office in 1987. Um, so if it was Wall Street's dream to have a single workstation with, with access to all of the variety of data feeds then covering their desks, how would it be realized? Um, the research field of distributed systems in computer science have been developing and debating techniques with com uh, for computers, potentially of different types, to communicate with each other. Um, so for example, uh, Remote Procedure Call, or RPC, was developed at Xerox Park in the 1970s and used the, uses the metaphor of a procedure call in programming languages, um, where one invokes a procedure and performs some calculation and then returns back to the point of the original invocation. Um, people familiar with programming thought this was an excellent paradigm, um, but as you'll note from the diagram, the client has to wait for the server to respond, um, somewhat like a back and forth telephone conversation. So uh, it's synchronous by default, this kind of um, this paradigm. Uh, by contrast, uh, researchers at Stanford and Rice uh, developed a system called the vKernel for what they call group communication, um, in which uh, you could have you know, one sender and multiple receivers, right? So this, that's why I use the word multicast up there. Um, broadcast would be sending it to everyone, everyone. Um, Interestingly, although this project was not explicitly developed for finance, uh, the author, David Sheraton, used a free market metaphor to justify his distributed system design. So he says, you know, an attractive paradigm for a dis distributed system is that of a free marketplace. Uh, this is in contrast to a single operating system, which is a centrally planned economy. Um, uh, and so th there's, there's this sort of like uh, financial thinking in the air here. Um, and in the v, like I said, in the vKernel, you could have one sender, multiple recipients. Um, and the authors actually uh, came up with this sort of publishing metaphor for this, um, uh, published subscribe metaphor. So uh, you have um, the process by which data consumers would subscribe to um, data producers or publishers. Um, and they were skeptical that, that you could implement this using uh, the RPC paradigm. So there's a big debate going on in the, in the 80s. Um, uh, one, one group or project which uh, combined the asynchronous paradigm with the multicast or group communication or publish subscribe uh, paradigm uh, was called the information bus. Um, and it explicitly targeted this problem that the, that the, that the uh, brokers on Wall Street were having with the too much data. So here, a little bit hard to see, um, but you have, uh, you have data sources on the right. So the stock exchange server is sending quotes and uh, tr trade reports. Um, the Reuters news server is sending news. Uh, risk management is sending information, and so um, uh, a trader or a workstation can sort of like decide that they only want to listen to you know uh, the IBM trades and just just get this information, or they want to subscribe to this and that. Um, the analytics server wants to subscribe to this and this other thing, and so the idea is to have this conceptually centralized but but actually distributed system that um, that can handle this flow of information and uh, in a way that's sort of feasible. Um, in a paper describing the system, um, the employees of uh, Technicron, which is the company that, that, that developed this, um, use the metaphor of a hardware bus. Uh, so they call it the information bus in the center here, uh, uh, in which data, is, you know, in which, like I said, data communications are centralized in one place. Um, and much like other work in financial technology, uh, the, one of the important bits was the 24/7 commercial environment. So that the emphasis on reliability was very strong, in the the um, uh, uh, the, the work on software and hardware for financial systems. And it, it led to um, you know, a, a real change in kind of what people expected from the reliability of computer systems, and that obviously changed, changed later. Um, uh, so as, and as you can see, they also adopt, at the bottom here, they, they also adopt the publish and describe kind of metaphor uh, from the vKernel. Um, and so this is eventually called a message broker, this kind of system. Uh, here's a picture of like Fidelity Investments in Boston in the late 80s. Uh, this is uh, with, with, the, with the information bus installation. So um, here you have the Bloomberg terminal um, and the, the turret phone and the, work, the single workstation that then has integrated all the other non-Bloomberg uh, data feeds. Um, and this is a picture of the market sheet software that, um, uh, that the Technicon uh, renamed TIPCO uh, developed. 
Um, and so not only did this kind of presentation of data arguably make the flows of market data more phenomenologically or at least interactionally present to traders, um, the underlying implementation could be used to break, uh, could be used to bring uh, this kind of data to retail investors as well. Um, and so Yahoo Finance, which is a sort of like you know popular website of the 90s, um, would have not exactly real time, but you know sort of 15 minute delayed uh, stock quotes. And so people who are day traders at home would use software like this or software that's a little bit more advanced um, and and take advantage of these real time flows uh, that that had then been sort of glued to the internet using similar techniques. Um, but it wasn't just stock ticker like feeds that you could glue together with these types of applications. Um, there was also the possibility of using <coughs> these asynchronous message techniques to glue together entire enterprises. Um, and so this is a view, this is a sort of fanciful view of, of the enterprise, this idea that it's all going to be connected into one big centralized database system. Um, this is called ERP or enterprise resource planning. This is not actually what large companies looked like. Uh, they actually look like this kind of heterogeneous chaos of systems that were glued together by spit and bale and wire um, and, and linked together by crude batch operations at best. But, but there was this promise that um, you know, the, the technology that TIBCO had developed would, would, would be able to kind of like cope, cope, a better cope with this kind of uh, system. And so that was called enterprise application integration, um, where it sort of assumed that in a large company, heterogeneity is the norm, geographical diversity is the norm, these legacy platforms that don't work well with each other. Um, and, and this became a kind of like you know popular paradigm in enterprise uh, you know computing, um, and it was called message-oriented middleware. So to you know uh, glue these systems together um, through asynchronous messaging. Um, and IBM was really caught off guard by this development. That you know IBM thought of a you know a company as having all IBM systems, and that changed a lot over the 80s and 90s. Uh, they had to buy a lot of companies to kind of implement their own message broker system that would be compatible um, and support uh, their hardware. Um, and so, pragmatically speaking, middleware and the message broker technique had become crucial in, in many environments. Um, so this is a, you know, a quote from a sort of industry journal. Um, for financial firms, middleware is like oxygen, pervasive, unseen, and often taken for granted, yet essential for life. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it also became apparent that if, you know, if middleware could bring financial services products together and corporate applications together, you know, it also would be helpful for acquisitions and mergers. Um, now, this is a graph of uh, bank mergers uh, from the early 90s to the late 2000s. Um, and when you look at this massive consolidation in the bank industry, we know a lot of it can be ascribed to regulatory change, which has been documented elsewhere in many places. Um, and we also know that you know, behind each of these mergers is some very complex socio-technical story. Um, but it's definitely the case that middleware of the sort described here um, was very useful in bringing together back-end back, back operations. Um, in mergers like this, in, at least in the cases where you know one company's systems weren't just thrown out entirely, uh, uh, and so you know if you want to complain about big banks, the tech, the story of the techniques I'm developing are, is kind of quite relevant. It like it it, it 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 facilitated a lot of those merger and acquisition processes, um, and so finally, uh, message brokers are still being reinvented today. So that they're quite popular in Silicon Valley right now um, because of the flow of asynchronous messages that is sort of underlying. Um, uh, underlying, you know, the largest websites. So LinkedIn developed one called Kafka, which is kind of like a log-centric uh, message broker, um, and, and that's Kafka is what underlies products like Slack, which are sort of like huge chat systems for large organizations. Um, and uh, message brokers are also a paradigm for communication in the Internet of Things. Um, the MQTT uh, system is basically a message broker, and it was um, developed initially to deal with the saturated network traffic from this oil pipeline project. You can kind of see at the bottom there. Um, all right, so conclusions and suggestions, like why did I go through all of this? Um, one, I want to say that the desires of financial markets, whether it's regard to transaction processing or dealing with heterogeneity or dealing with real-time flows, give clues to how data technologies and techniques will be used and abused elsewhere, especially in an era of marketization. So if you want to know like what people will do with a large flow of data, look to finance and see what they do with a large flow of data. And you might get clues as to say how you know, insurance companies are going to do, use large flows of data. Um, so, oops, sorry, two, uh, the phenomenological qualities of data, like this, this uh, distinction between data as finite and data as potentially, in, potentially infinite um, can inform an understanding of systems, ontologies, and power. So they don't have to, you, you don't, when you use a system, it doesn't have to be a black box. You can sort of think, well, what is the underlying message flow? Is it a static database or is it something that's in motion? If it's in motion, is it being stored? Is it not being stored? You can learn, you can learn about the system without necessarily getting into the, 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 the code itself. Um, 
And finally, uh, that fundamental communication paradigms that go back to the age of telegraphy and even railroads, I think go back there, but that's where a lot of those terms come from, uh, like synchronous and asynchronous, unicast and multicast, um, eternally recur uh, in each layered socio-technical context. So you know, these, these, they come up again and again, depending on the sort of layered you know, data systems that we, that we live in, whether it's a visual regime or tele telegraphic or packet switched or service oriented, there's always this kind of like dialectic between um, you know, uh, uh, more static systems and more dynamic systems. All right, and thanks, that's it. So I've, I've changed my topic a little bit to reflect my interest in the uh, prospectus as, as increasingly a, a document that I feel is um, not just understudied and underappreciated, but is an important part of both framing and communicating the, the, the core proposition of, uh, of contemporary enterprises, going right back to the late 1800s, um, and particularly uh, from a communication and media perspective, which is where I'm coming from, the notion of having a document that is trying to make a business case, that is trying to articulate uh, a business model, is one that I find really quite fascinating. So let's, um, let's uh, look beyond the old salty guy here digging for nuggets. Um, this is, uh, I just wanted to quickly point out that what I'll be sharing with you today is largely the kind of conceptual framework that um, I'm developing in this uh, book project, which whose title is probably going to change, but I thought I'd throw that one up there for now. And uh, there's a series of, of articles here that I've been uh, working on over the last four years or so that, again, in large part, um, look, go right back to the late 1800s to look at how the regulatory environment has changed through the Companies Act, particularly in the United Kingdom, and started to, and how the Companies Act started to mandate the requirement of or the need to, um, to use uh, uh, external accountants. And moving forward, one of the key um, duties of external accountants for uh, companies, and then of course uh, contemporary uh, media, uh, social media companies, is to help um, write these documents called uh, the uh, prospectus. So, oh, I forgot one more. Anyway, so what I, w I have a, a fairly, um, I was a bit uh, blown away by all the information you presented, and it was fantastic, but I have probably a very quick and digestible um, argument that I want to make, and again, it's, 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 it's largely a conceptual one. And the argument I want to make is that um, we have given too much attention to the attention economy argument, the attention economy uh, framework for understanding what the key um, business proposition or the business model is, in particular for contemporary um, social media companies. Now, I'll just, I'll probably just speak about Facebook today, but my work also extends beyond Facebook to other social media platforms, to Google, to Yahoo, and as you may have seen earlier, to earlier companies such as um, Marconi. And I think someone like uh, Christian Fuchs, hopefully everyone can see that at the back, is uh, someone who's, uh, who's written quite extensively um, adopting this uh, business, uh, this uh, attention economy, uh, argument uh, as a way of uh, uh, piggybacking upon Dallas Smythe's work, of course, which uh, um, I'm sure a few of you are familiar with, making the case that that we are watching as we are working. So the the notion of the of attention and capturing our attention and laboring while we are watching is a key one for Fuchs and of course for many other people. Um, in, 19, in 2009, Facebook reported its, uh, its um, financial statement, reported that 98% of its revenue came from uh, online sales. Okay? And this is roughly about three years before the company went public. Okay? So if you look at those numbers, that would, that would actually support right, the conceptual framework that Fuchs and others are, uh, are forwarding. Right? That we are watch that we are watching um, uh, ads 
and uh, that is in effect fueling um, the system. But as I said, by 2012, that number starts to quite dramatically reduce. Okay, so only just over 80% of of the company's revenue now starts to come from ads. So, in many ways, um, I, I simply want to ask the question, try to ask the question, not just empirically but conceptually, how. Um, can we continue to use the attention economy or the advertising framework to uh, understand the uh, deleterious uh, impacts, if you will, of companies such as Facebook? Well, where is this, where is this 18% and growing figure coming from, and how can we account for it on a more conceptual uh, level? Um, I want to make the case that um, in lieu of a kind of an attention economy framework, that we need to look at companies like Facebook and other financialized companies <coughs> as uh, speculative enterprises. Okay. Um, uh, I find it qu quite intriguing that a lot of the metaphors that are, are still used with regards to social media companies still focus on these kind of industrial metaphors. and. And I've always thought that that's, um, that's quite a limiting factor. So how else can we think about this? So I did kind of uh, grasp the notion of speculation as, as a fairly obvious one. So this is a roundabout way of kind of uh, justifying my interest, I guess, in looking at finan the financial prospectus, which in the United States is called S1. And how can we use these documents as a way of thinking through a more speculative way of understanding um, media and social media um, companies. Um, and apparently other people, in addition to myself, were downloading uh, <laughs> these uh, prospectuses. So all that to suggest that these documents um, have become incredibly popular and have become picked through right, as, as financial documents that need to be kind of deciphered. Um, to decode it, if you will, to get at these questions of, of kind of where is the company going? What are they selling? How are they, in fact, explaining to the market and by extension beyond the market what the core value proposition is, right, um, of this company? Um, another kind of key part of, of my larger research project is uh, is looking at the period just before during and after the um, the public issuing of, of stocks or the IPO um, because what I found and I don't have enough time to get into it today is that this is the and here's the, the three-year period um, here for Facebook from 2009 to 2012 is that Roughly, kind of, uh, roughly around 65% of the changes that you see on that platform over the last 10 years occur during this three-year period in advance, in preparation of the IPO. So that's, that should be an indicator, right, that this process of financialization is, change, is, is fundamentally changing the media itself, right? And many of these changes, of course, are intensifying the process of collecting uh, user uh, data. Um, the attention economy kind of framework, or, or as I put up here, kind of answer to this phenomenon, this rapid increase in the ways in which uh, Facebook and other companies are trying to kind of data mine their consumer base, is that they are trying to, as I put here, kind of encourage more participation, and this participation would then, again, lead to more eyeballs and other uh, interfaces, which again increase potential advertising revenue. And and uh, again, I'm not I'm not suggesting this is not an important component to Facebook and other social media companies. It's just it's declining, right? Um, my um, an important um, argument that I want to make in this kind of more kind of prospecting, this kind of data uh, mining, and also a speculative framework. Is that, um, is that Facebook is also looking to integrate uh, non-users, right? So not just users, not just uh, users who are eyeballing the site, 
but others who are not eyeballing the site, right? Who are not integrated, again, in this uh, attention economy framework. And so there are a number of uh, reports in 2011 which talk about how um, Facebook and uh, Google and others are, inco are incorporating non-users into their data profiling uh, systems. So you have what's, what are called shadow or ghost uh, profiles. So that's just, that's just one simple example to suggest that we cannot simply or we cannot only look at comp social media companies and the, uh, through their user base alone. Um, so that we cannot just criticize or understand these companies through kind of a legal framework or a privacy framework. We need to understand them as having a much larger social impact. Um, I'm already running out of time, so I'm going to speed up here. Um, some of this I've already talked about. Um, I don't have time uh, to expand upon this, but this is a really, for me, it's a really interesting um, uh, area of research. <coughs> and again, I think it's really... Not, not terribly uh, developed is, is looking at that this unique form of communication that seeks to to uh, have individuals or groups invest their money. There's something about that. I guess uh, some people have written about kind of the pitch and how there's a certain form of communication that, that goes along with standing up in front of an audience or or devising some kind of communication strategy that's all about getting people to depart with their <coughs> money. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get into that today. Here we go. Let's just say it's a unique form of communication. <laughs> um, and that uh, this is a, a legal requirement. Um, if I had more time, I'd talk about the, the larger political economy of, of the role that uh, the prospectus plays. And those of you who know this story well uh, will know that um, the, it, there was a shit show, right? That, in fact, Facebook uh, filed. Uh, their uh, prospectus um, and didn't show everyone all of the um, all of the information. They only gave insiders uh, kind of more more kind of hedging their uh, their statements up upon the, their future growth. Um, so um, Facebook. What's interesting about Facebook here too is that. They, they did, I think it's six or seven revisions. So the Facebook prospectus kind of bounced around, right? Between the underwriters, between the market regulators, and other large financial institutions. Um, and then of course, Facebook themselves. And they were required at least six times to revise their prospectus. So the prospectus itself, uh, I would argue, is, 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 a, is a document, is kind of a living document, particularly during this this, uh, this point in time that serves to kind of remind or, or indicate to us who, the, who are the major players who are involved in articulating and defining, again, what that core value proposition um, for the IPO and for the market itself. And in the end, uh, Facebook's answer to that, that question that I've been hitting on, like what is the core proposition or what's the core value in that company, is, um, is not users, right? So I, I would contend that the, the, the um, attention economy framework says that it is users, right? That it's the user base that creates the uh, value. It's a user base that are exploited, right? Okay. In fact, even Facebook themselves say, well, it's not just users. It is um, the uh, relationships that users are engaged in, okay? Um, Another way of, of answering that question, too, is to look at the work of people such as uh, Pygos uh, Cote and Blanque, and, and there are many others, um, and Helmand has done some work on this, too, um, looking at the social graph, and in fact, making the case that the value proposition is really encoded or encapsulated in the social graph, which is, of course, a set of, of relationships, not individual account-holding users who are eyeballing um, websites. I'm just going to... So, uh, yep, here we go. I've already gone over this stuff here, and I'm running out of time, because this is a presentation that usually lasts 45 minutes. Um, so I'm going to skip here to the end. <laughs> Where does that leave us with little time? So prospecting 
um, as I've articulated it here. During this particular point in time, where the value of the company is, is uh, articulated and defined and redefined, and then disseminated to the market, um, is not just, as I put here, mining or looking for value. It does not simply extract value from users, or so-called workers. It, in fact, governs access to or not to capital. And here's one quick example before I kind of uh, depart the stage here is um, Facebook recently, a couple years ago, um, sought and were given a patent um, that would help lenders discriminate against borrowers based on their social connections. There are many other examples like that as well. Okay, And those so social connections, of course, are not limited to the, uh, the user base of um, the company. Um, to the platform. So moving forward, for me, what remains to be answers is to what the answer is to what degree will Facebook both define and cost, you know, the expanding data points, right? So if the argument is that value is not inherently tied to individual users, then we're moving into a more social graph economy. Um, then where is that? Where is the value? Um, where is the revenue coming from? Quite a bit of the revenue um, coming back to that 82 percent is coming from partnerships with mobile companies. It used to be for a little while that there were some gaming, what was that game called? Farmhouse or Farm something? Farm Farmville. Farmville, thank you. Farmhouse. Wasn't even close. But now most of it is created um, out of uh, mobile. Okay. Which of course generates a whole set of geographic data points. So the question is now moving forward um, what is Facebook's relationship to that data economy going to be? And there's, uh, there's already some answers to that question, but I'm out of time, so perhaps we can talk about it during the Q&A.